I just keep trickling in. It's kind of been the trend for all of these. So thank you all for joining. I know it's a Friday afternoon slash evening, but it's really great to just be able to connect with students that we already know and then new people, new faces or old faces too. Um, so Ariel is going to lead this and um, I'm really glad she did so. So <laughs> um, I'm excited to hear what you all have to say. And again, thank you for coming. I'm going to pass it over to her. And um, do you want me to start screen sharing now? Or do you, um, you just give me the cue? Yeah, I'll give you the cue. I just okay. wanted to introduce everyone first. Uh, so if you want to wave or say hey, uh, but if you're not speaking, obviously just turn your mute on if you don't mind. Um, but for most of you know me, obviously, but just in case, my name's Ariel. Um, I'm a partner and co-founder of Orbis Landscape Architecture in Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, and I'm a class of 2019. So I'm just going to go alphabetically. So Kristen Allen, do you hear me say <laughs> She's also a class of 2019, and she works at American Company in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, Elena Alves, she is class of 2017. She works at a multidisciplinary firm in, called Strata, Strata in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Will Belcher, who has, this is his second time participating in these uh, videos things, which is super cool. Anyway, class of 2007, he's the start and owner of Ground Control in Philly, Pennsylvania. Uh, Sam Cohen, class of 2018, works at MVVA or Michael Van Valkenburg in New York. Carter Gresham, class of 2016, works at SN. S and M E Inc. in Orlando, Florida. And Nathan Lay, who's my business partner and friend, class of 2006, again, Orbis Landscape Architecture in Portsmouth, Virginia. So if you want to go ahead and start the PowerPoint, Amanda. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I believe everyone has the option um, at the top of your screen where you, it says view options to request remote control. So if you have a lot of um, slides, feel free to request that so that you can control this, uh, the tempo of the slides per se. Um, but we can go ahead and get started. This PowerPoint is going to be up for the students, so this is for the reference, and then I'm going to send contact information out to them afterwards as well, so they're going to get all of this stuff later. So, let me... Okay, I think I requested... Okay, cool. So, I think Sam has to go a little bit early, so we're going to let him go first. Yep. Hey everyone, nice to see some friendly faces and new faces. Um, as Ariel said, I'm working at Michael Van Valkenburg Associates, um, started there right out of school. Um, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Ariel, people are interested in, I guess, how we got started there and like, just starting yeah. there, um, I guess for a lot of people that are looking at starting jobs and things, I got my opportunity through a connection I had at the firm um, through Austin Chase, if you know him. Um, and I kind of got an interview. And then from there, um, I did a two week or a week trial there um, and ended up uh, getting an offer after that. And so I've been there for two years now um, as a senior designer. Um, Next slide. I think it takes a minute. There's a lag, by the way. Hmm. Ah, okay. So this is a photo from an event we had. So these are some of my coworkers. And this was obviously back 
for the quarantine in New York. Um, and so living in New York and working in the office was pretty great. I mean, you get pretty close to your coworkers there because we're working usually 12 to 14 hour days are pretty typical. Um, so not much of a, a work life balance, at least starting out there. Um, but since, um, I guess quarantine and kind of the lockdown, um, a lot of us have had an opportunity to start working remotely as I'm sure a lot of people have experienced. Um, so currently I'm out in Colorado. I've been out there for four months now. Um, and so that's been pretty nice. And I guess I'll talk about some of the flexibility of the firm during this time. And um, I mean, I don't know how much of this will be helpful moving forward. I'm not sure any of us know exactly how long this is going to last, but so far uh, it's been pretty nice. Next slide. Okay, so this is Colorado. I guess I'm just going to talk about Colorado and some of the stuff I've been doing um, outside work. So, um, yeah, I showed up in mid March, and I think we got like 18 inches of snow immediately once I got there. Um, it's been pretty nice out here. So, we're two hours behind New York. So, um, getting finished with work when there's still light out. So being able to have more of that balance in work. Um, so these are just some hikes in the Rocky Mountains, which I'm currently staying at. Next slide. Um, during this time, I've also been able to go out to Utah. Um, and so these are just some of those photos from that trip. This is down in, uh, it's not Zion. I think it's called Jacob's Arch, which is really an incredible thing to see um, experience. Those really don't do it justice. And um, yeah, I definitely recommend people get out there if and when they can. And um, yeah, for sure. Next slide. Um, more photos from that Utah trip, which I think are the rest of the slides, but these are some of the slot canyons I guess experience. And it's actually been quite amazing for work to be able to get out and do some of these things. And I know, at least for myself, working in the city, it can be tough when you're sitting at a computer a lot of the time. And I don't know being able to get out and kind of see these landscapes it's pretty inspiring um, and fun to bring them back into our own designs and potentially playscapes that we work on and this is a photo from a like five-day backpacking trip through um, buckskin gulch which once again, if anyone can ever get out here, definitely try to get out here. In the left photo there, you can see my tent, which you try to get up as high as you can get out of the water, but really a phenomenal experience um, out there. Is that all the photos? Yeah. So uh, to sum up, yeah, it's, it's, ah, it's been great to get out of the city and do some of this stuff and um hopefully i know for people starting to join the the workforce hopefully they get an opportunity to pick somewhere nice to work remote for the time being but definitely feel lucky um, to be out here awesome thank you sam for those beautiful photos um and i know you have to leave early so whenever you leave that's fine uh but for the students if you have questions about mvba just forward them over to me and I'll give them to Sam. So Kristen, whenever you're ready. Sure, um, well, unfortunately, because of the quarantine and where I'm located, I do not have many fun photos of travels abroad unless you're thinking Indiana is exotic, but <laughs> um, I'm Kristen. So I graduated in 2019, as Ariel said, 
and I've been working at Merrick for a little under a year now. Um, so it's in Charlotte. You go to the next slide. <clears throat> Those are lag. There is a lag. Can you just give it a second? <laughs> So when I was applying to jobs, I told myself that I didn't want to work in the South except for Charlotte. So here we are, but <laughs> I really liked Charlotte. Um, we actually went once when we were second years as a studio and kind of walked around and ironically, my apartment is right next to where we were walking around as a studio. So that, <laughs> that's kind of funny, um, but I really love the city. It's been growing so much and there's just so many young people and so much going on um, that I thought this would be a great place to practice landscape architecture. And with an interest in kind of urban planning and city planning, I thought it would be a great spot for me. So here we are. Um, I love Charlotte so far. Um, it's been really fun. There's a lot of Hokies here, so you can always meet new people pretty easily. Um, and the thing they don't tell you about like moving to a new city is like, Everyone is trying to look for friends, so don't worry, you'll be set there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, um, really enjoyed Charlotte, and my company is really fun. Um, there's just a couple examples of me trying to get outside and really explore and figure out what the heck to do now that everything is closed. So <laughs> I've tried to just you know walk the greenways. That's one of my favorite pastimes here because they're very well maintained and it's really nice and. When it's not too hot, just sit outside and maybe sketch a little bit. Um, yeah, as for my company, um, we do a lot of land planning, um, designs of uh, subdivisions. Um, this is an example of our site visit to do a planning study for a greenway tra trail. Um, and then this is, so I should back up. The company I work for, Merrick, has is a primarily an engineering company and they have so many different branches of engineering like nuclear engineering civil engineering um even like like health services engineering biomedical engineering so the cool thing about being this new developing landscape architecture portion of the land design um arm of it is that we can kind of team up with other disciplines and be like, hey, like I saw you're designing something for the US Army Corps of Engineers for like their subdivision. Like we can get out on that and work on a park. And so this is actually how that happened. So this is a park in Puerto Rico for the Fort Buchanan base. Um, and we got to design it and do all kinds of cool renderings with Lumion. And it was really fun to like just learn about all the cool plants down there, even if I didn't get to go personally, but um, yeah, it was a really cool thing that um, I would never expect to have done in an engineering firm. So yeah, we have, and we have, you know, people who really um, can expand their passions. So my one coworker that made these drawings, he's really into like VR, AR and the whole like SketchUp Lumion making things 3D. Um, so because we're such a big company and we have a lot of resources, we can be like, okay, you wanna learn about that? You can just take a deep dive and we can find some ways for you to apply it, even if it's not in land development, um, even if it's for like nuclear technology, but you're still using VR and AR. Um, so that's one of the positives of our firm too. And then this is one of the site plans that I did. So we do a lot of subdivisions. That's kind of like our thing in the Charlotte office. And it's been really cool to kind of like see how all of the things like lay out like in the real world. And especially like, cause Wendy's studio was my favorite studio. Um, I really just find it fascinating. Like the balance between problem solving um, and actually like getting things on paper and making them look nice. So. Yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'll pass the baton. Thanks, Kristen. Also, please be writing down questions because I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of time for them at the end. Um, so Elena, whenever you're ready. So should I request this? Is that easiest? 
Yeah, I think if you go to view options and request the remote access, it's on the bottom left corner. All right, so hello, Elena Alves here. Um, I graduated class of 2017. So let's see where we start with the slides. So this is Pittsburgh. I guess it's a little, I'll start where I actually started. I worked um, at Bowman Engineering uh, when I first graduated. I um, am from New Jersey and got an internship my fourth year with them in Morristown, which was close to home. And luckily they had offered me a job at the end of my internship, which was kind of nice rolling into the fifth year, feeling like I didn't have to worry too much about that. Um, so I moved back home after school in 2017 and worked for them. And Bowman, let me see if I can find, Okay, here we go, yeah. Um, they're predominantly uh, civil engineering with some geotechnical and landscape, and similar to what sounds like Kristen's experience, I was part of kind of a newly forming landscape architecture program. So at my office, I was one of two landscape architects, um, and I worked pretty much hands-on on, in, on everything that came through the office that was landscape related. Um, so this was my first project that I took from concept to construction, which is just such an awesome feeling to see your work uh, get built. And I think when you actually see these things, all the design frustration uh, that led up to it kind of finally uh, pays off. And it's definitely something to look forward to when you get to that stage. Um, but this was a playground in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Newark, but it's a pretty big urban hub in New Jersey. Um, so that was, was, this was just a really cool experience. Um, playground design is, is very fun. Definitely new to me, but I learned a lot going through this. Um, just working so directly with uh, civil engineers, I learned just a lot about the construction process in general, construction documents, putting them together actually how things move from concept to real worlds and uh, I believe that experience was really good for me and just in terms of um, seeing how other branches of design work as well so now that I work for a multidisciplinary firm I know how engineers work and um, can kind of think about the things they might be thinking about when when we're working together on a project. So that was that. Uh, I left Bowman in, I cannot see the little arrows, there they are. I left Bowman in March, 2019 to go on a little bit of an adventure. Let's see if it comes up. Yeah, so I put my job in 2019 to hike the Appalachian Trail. So I did a full through hike. I did five months on trail. It was the probably the best thing I might ever do. <laughs> I peaked too early. That's fine. We'll find something to top it. Uh, but I think I fell in love with the trail, you know, living in Blacksburg for five years. The AT runs so close to the campus. So if you haven't gone out there yet, you definitely should because it is just, I think, one of the most awesome resources uh, our country offers. It's a 2,200 mile long trail from Georgia to Maine, if you're not familiar. Um, and I think what this taught me was that sometimes it's good to break from the status quo a little bit. Uh, I think I was really nervous, you know, just starting a career to kind of take a big step in a different direction when I think there's a lot of pressure, at least I felt like there was a lot of pressure in kind of getting into my career, building my career up. I should be at a certain level by this age. And, you know, I think that's something that isn't necessarily the best way to do things for everyone. So you got to kind of figure out what you need, what's, what's going to be right for you. And yeah, I was definitely nervous to do something like this. I was like, will someone ever hire me again? What will they think? And then, you know, you do it and you're not so worried after that. So uh, this definitely taught me what I was capable of. And uh, 
it just probably taught me more about myself than a whole career might ever be able to. So I'm definitely happy I did that. And in no time I was back to working and, you know, wishing I was uh, in the woods again. <laughs> So I moved to Pittsburgh pretty much right after I got off trail this past October, 2019. And um, my boyfriend works for Perkins Eastman and he had found a job. We were looking to move to Pittsburgh. Um, so that kind of just started the process. I had never really known what was going on in Pittsburgh until my fifth year of thesis when I was looking for a site for a waterfront project and I visited a few cities and Pittsburgh really stuck out. Uh, it's just an awesome place to live. I think a lot of people don't really know about it because it's out kind of in the Midwest. I don't know if you'd call it Midwest, but it's teetering for sure. Um, if people were wondering why I moved out here and I was like, you just gotta come check it out. And so we moved out here and in no time I was working for Strata, which is pretty, it's a mid-size, I would say, multidisciplinary firm. They have an office in Pittsburgh and an office in Philadelphia. So I work with architects, interior design, graphic design, urban planners, and it's been really, really awesome kind of just learning from a whole new group of people architects, interior designers, you know, things I really had no grasp of. So that's been great. And these are just a couple little projects I've been working on. Um, on the top, this was just a quick, honest project uh, for the North Shore. And in this, none of this means anything, but it was a big mixed use project. Um, I did all of the landscape at the street level and then they were looking to do a nice rooftop design so I put that together um, and now I am essentially the project manager for the the bottom two images which is a new plaza development in the south side neighborhood and that's been really fun it's been my first I would say job that I have a lot of control over in terms of decision making. Um, actually, my project manager for this just moved to a new uh, firm, so that is why I am not the project manager. Uh, so it's going to be a big challenge, but super excited to dive in and start learning about that process, which is a whole new ball game, I think, um, and maybe not the most fun part of design, but that's okay. So I'm also working on a few other projects that are moving into construction administration. So I think this new job, I've only been here for eight months and I've gotten a pretty good uh, feel for a lot of new components of, of the whole design, uh, the design process. So uh, look forward to more to come and we do, hire you know summer interns and we are looking to grow this landscape architecture program as well so if anyone has interest in pittsburgh you just reach out and you know do an office visit or something but yeah i think, I think that's what i have so far am i done okay all right yeah thanks elena that should be all your slides um okay. amanda if you want to get to the next stuff okay and if Elena, if you don't mind giving up the control of the screen. How do, how do we give it up? Stop remote control. Got it. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we can move on to the next person. And Will, if you would like control, then I can also like approve that. I think it's easier if only two people are on at the same time. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Hey, everyone. There is a bit of a delay here. Um, well, this is thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm Will. You saw me like a week ago, maybe, two weeks ago. Um, I graduated in 2007, um, and my thesis advisor was Terry, Terry Clements. Um, this is still not showing you. Am I doing something wrong here? I can try on my end, but it should work. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, 
we're like in the middle of a move and somehow I was able to find this. This is my thesis from 2007, it's starting to yellow, which is very scary. Um, Cause I still feel like I just graduated yesterday. Um, try next slide. I'll just say next slide. Okay. I think you also, it says it's waiting for you to, you might have to approve something else on your end, but I can do next slide for you. Whatever works. I don't see anything uh, that I need to approve, but anyway, I'll just say next slide. So just a little bit about me and kind of what I, I enjoy doing. I grew up uh, in the foothills of Virginia, just um, east of Charlottesville um, on, a, on a lake. Uh, and um, it was an incredible experience because I got, I got to really understand the geology and the hydrology of, of the area that I, that I lived. Um, getting to know the oak and hickory forest uh, and all the flora and fauna of that ecosystem was something that kind of shaped who I was and kind of what I was interested in. Um, next slide. Um, and then also I spent a lot of summers at my parents' cottage up in um, the Thousand Islands. And, you know, that being a totally different ecosystem, different hydrological system, um, you know, the grant, huge granite outcroppings um, and a totally different ecology kind of made me realize how unique places were and how you could, as a designer, um, reinforce that sense of place as you think about design. Next slide. Um, I enjoy building, you know, I think getting your hands dirty, whether it's planting or, or building objects or building um, follies like, like this one. This is like a, a sleeper cabin up at, um, uh, in the Thousand Islands. It really teaches you how to put things together and, and how to craft timeless um, objects that will stand the test of time. You know, we have a much harder job than architects because uh, our material palette is um, open to the elements and uh, mother nature is a harsh bitch sometimes. So, you know, learning how to create things that don't fall apart uh, is really hard. Next slide. Um, <laughs> this is really dorky, but I also really enjoy flying model airplanes. Um, I think there's something beautiful about airplanes and um, I think a lot of benches that I've designed in the past kind of look like airplanes. So I don't know, I just, I love beautiful objects and I think that um, enjoying beautiful objects you to um, design beautiful things yourself. As dorky as that sounds. Next slide. Um, I also uh, traveled quite a bit um, until I had kids. <laughs> Um, both for work and for play. This is um, Iceland. If you ha haven't had a chance to go to Iceland, it's incredible. It's only like a five hour flight from the East Coast. Um, and this is one of many, many spectacular uh, events on the island. We ended up spending like nine days just driving the loop road around Iceland. And it is incredibly memorable. I mean, just the scale and sheer thunder uh, of this waterfall changed me forever. Um, just insanely powerful um, natural experience. Next slide. Uh, I also done a fair bit of sailing and you know, being out on the water also kind of changes the way you think. Um, you know, the huge expanse of, of oceans. This is us on the way to Bermuda. Um, again, beautiful objects, but um, getting out of your comfort zone in the middle of nowhere kind of changes you and, and allows you to kind of look outward, but also look inward at the same time. Next slide. Um, my wife and I also love um, treasure hunting. So we spend a lot of our weekends um, 
garage sailing and uh, going to estate sales and things like that. Um, again, in search of beautiful things. Um, but what that allows you to do is get out on the road and, and see the landscape and see um, the environment in which you exist. Next slide. Uh, I, one of my other favorite pastimes, I don't know if anyone knows Nicholas Denny, but this is Nicholas in this photo. Um, in search of beautiful trees, um, I absolutely love going to tree nurseries because every time you go there, you learn something new about our profession and, and the way things are heading uh, as far as plant material. Um, these are uh, slender silhouette sweet gums. All the trees that you see, the, the kind of stocky ones on either side, were uh, slender silhouettes that were cut down and they're growing back as normal sweet gums. Um, but Nicholas is next to a slender silhouette, which is an extremely fast digit um, sweet gum that almost looks like a corn dog. And we ended up using these at a project I'll show you in just a few seconds. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, I also think, you know, just getting out um, and looking down, you know, a lot of architects look up, but I love looking down at materials and kind of cataloging them. Um, it's like this, um, this internal mainframe that you have as a brain. Um, as you kind of catalog all of these memories and all of these things that you see in the natural and, and built environment, over time becomes an incredible tool for you um, because it allows you to reference things. It allows you to reference projects, materials, how things were put together. So I just enjoy going out and taking photos of pavement. People probably think I'm a complete weirdo, but um, I just love ephemeral moments like this. And my daughter does too. She, next slide. Um, so I started my career in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, working for a firm called Land Design. Um, we uh, took what was a concrete parking deck over a stream, unearthed, demoed it, unearthed the stream, um, restored the stream channel, uh, and built the Little, Sh Little Sugar Creek Greenway. Um, that was a pretty amazing project to be a part of uh, and kind of shaped and crafted kind of my trajectory to Olin. Next slide. We also spent a, quite a bit, we, um, I was hired in a recession and all the work in the United States had stopped um, and there was a massive layoff. 80% of the firm was laid off. And so like one out of five people were left. And we ended up doing a lot of work in China, and this is um, Duke University and Kunshan. It got built almost overnight. It's incredible how fast they build there. Next slide. <clears throat> so out of the, I, I, you guys have heard the story probably five times, so I'm kind of being redundant here, but I ended up going up to Olin uh, and worked on little, or uh, on um, Mill River Park, which, won an ASLA uh, honor award in 2015, maybe. Um, but the, all the work that I did on Little Sugar Creek really allowed me to kind of hone my skills at Mill River. Next slide. Very similarly, um, you know, we restored a stream channel and est established an ecology that was true to the place. Uh, right in the heart of the city that really allowed people to be immersed in um, an environment that's chocked full of flora and fauna. Um, and you almost forget that you're in the middle of Stanford, Connecticut. Next slide. Um, then I had the incredible opportunity to work on Apple Park with Lori Olin for two years, which was an incredibly exhausting experience, but um, uh, rewarding to to say the least. Um, and again, this was an abstraction of the, the local ecology. Uh, we took all of the excavations out of the basement that made way for car parking underneath the curved building and created hills that were reminiscent of um, the, 
in the local place. Next slide. Um, so we incorporated uh, Norman Foster's architecture into a landscape that is true to place. Um, there's over 8,000 trees that were planted um, on, on this parcel of land, which was really just um, a flat plain of parking lots and benign 1970s office architecture. Uh, so we kind of transformed what well, we did transform what was kind of a benign placeless place into an immersive um, Northern California experience. Next slide. <clears throat> I also um, led the, uh, the design uh, and now it's under construction, this piece right in front of the, you can see the large water feature there. Um, the design and implementation of the Alexandria waterfront plan, which uh, reconnects the entire waterfront of Alexandria, which was disconnected by private, um, privately owned parcels, um, eroding uh, riverbanks, things like that, and just reconnected the entire thing. And what's funny is uh, the client for this is Matt Landis, who graduated in my class from Virginia Tech. So your classmates become your, your clients very quickly. And you never know who's going to be uh, your your next client. So be nice to everybody. Next slide. Um, I then left Olin and went to work for a good friend of mine, David Rubin, at Land Collective. And together we um, built uh, Penovation Works, which is an incubation hub here in Philadelphia um, for the University of Pennsylvania. So the building you kind of see off in the distance where all the trees are pointing to is it's kind of the, the catalyst for the campus. And everything that you see in front of you will eventually be developed. So we created an ephemeral landscape of those slender silhouette sweet gums um, and then a five acre meadow over a very contaminated site um, with walking paths. So again, it's this immersive um, landscape experience that's unexpected. Um, and so all the researchers that are working in the building can go out there and just kind of forget where they are for five seconds, which is kind of like a, you know, control alt delete for your mind, which I think is super important. Next slide. Um, this is it in winter. Um, again, just completely immersive experience, super powerful. Um, this is where, this is the grove. And this is where everyone kind of meets for happy hours, probably not on a day like today, but um, I think it's the first triple, triple liter um, platinous grove in the world. Next slide. Um, and then we worked with, um, David and I worked with Deborah Burke Partners uh, on um, Cummins Distribution Headquarters in Indianapolis. This is where the old arena used to sit. Um, it's where Elvis played his last um, performance. You know, Elvis has left the building. So they completely, um, it was a completely flat um, um, parcel when we got it. And um, we transformed it into this uh, urban forest that was um, kind of a, a setting for this super futuristic um, office designed by Deborah Burke Partners. Next slide. Uh, then I'm sorry, I'm probably over on time, huh? Are you okay? okay. Keep going. <laughs> it turns out David and I were better friends and colleagues. So I went back to Olin and um, spent a couple years there. Uh, this is the University of Arkansas. We worked with um, a architecture firm called Lear's Wines Apple um, and built this residence hall, um, which was just a parking lot previously. It's the, um, the largest mass timber residence hall in the nation. So it's all built out of the structure itself is built out of mass timber. Um, and it has a green roof that connect. I can't, I don't know if I can point it, but yeah. So that kind of glassy building on the bottom left um, is called the cabin, which is the major social space that connects the two colleges. And on top of that is a, a green roof that we installed. And um, it's the first green roof over a um, mass timber structure. 
Next slide. Uh, this is it. Um, I think it was this was in the spring, but we we used the native stone um, from the region to create uh, generous seating areas, um, lots of flexible seating under this. We were able to save this existing oak grove, uh, and then the landscape kind of sinuously weaves the buildings together with the ADA accessible path that. Um, that, uh, you know, it's like 28 feet of grade change. So it kind of navigates that nicely and you don't really feel like you're walking down 28 feet. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> because of the work we did on, on uh, Doe Hill, which I just showed you, Deborah Burke reached out to me and, and asked if we wanted to work on um, Princeton's new residential colleges. So this is a, a collaborative rendering that we did with them um, of the dining hall. Um, really trying to reinforce the idea of indoor outdoor experiences. Um, so there's indoor dining, outdoor dining with full floor to ceiling windows um, in, in an immersive um, Aspen Grove. Uh, and, you know, that was one of the, the Aspens were something that we used at Cummins um, with Deborah Burke. And they're like, we love those trees. So we ended up doing like a massive grove of them, which is truly their kind of, uh, natural siding is like an aspen grove it's like one one organism uh, and so that's what we were trying to create and kind of symbolize that everyone in a residential college is kind of this one organism uh, next one um <clears throat> and then we worked with deborah's team um that resident or that dining hall that you just saw is right underneath these people um, because of the grade change across the site, um, we couldn't bring that up to this upper level. So we had the idea of punching a hole in it and creating what I call the terrarium, which is this kind of almost like mo 60s modern, 50s modern um, idea. And that you could look down in it and, you know, see a friend. You could walk down the stairs and meet them but kind of this romantic um, idea of, of living in the woods. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> this was a, a sketch that I did on an Amtrak train with the client for the National Desert Storm Memorial. Um, I always have a pen on me and you never know when you're gonna like have an aha moment. Um, and this one was like on an Amtrak train. So we, before I left to form ground control, I was working on the National Desert Storm Memorial, <clears throat> which is just um, just north of the Washington. I think the next slide has kind of a contextual image of it. Yeah. So that's the, um, <clears throat> did I say Washington Monument? I meant um, Lincoln Memorial, the Lincoln Monument. So that's the Lincoln Monument off in the background. Um, and this, Desert Storm Memorial takes up a very small portion of an, current, uh, an existing athletic field, um, but also completes uh, the levee work. So the monument is also acting as a levee to complete um, the flood work in this area of, of the wash of the mall. So I think this is still in fundraising, but should be built soon. But the the concept is that these curvilinear walls represent dunes um, um, to, you know, to represent the, where the battle was fought. Go into it in more detail, but next slide. Um, then I started ground control. I was um, at Olin and, you know, perfectly happy. Uh, an architect reached out to me and said, hey, Will, we want to work with you, but Olin's so expensive, we can't afford them on this project. Have you ever thought about going out on your own? And I said, sure, I'll do it. Um, so last January, I formed Ground Control. Um, this is one of our first projects. It's the um, White Marsh Valley Country Club. Uh, we did their Golf and Grounds Master Plan, which is like a 15-year vision for the course. Um, there's a plethora of course improvements, but also landscape improvements to reinforce uh, a sense of arrival. Um, and really activate the clubhouse and pool house to be a 21st century 
um, money-making engine. That's what these these clubs are, um, and a lot of them are really outdated. So our job was to um, really bring the energy of of the clubhouse outside and create revenue generating landscapes, which is a huge part of, of what we do, um, especially now that uh, people can't dine inside. Next slide. One, one other thing that we did, um, oh, this is just a drone photo that I took of, of the course. Um, we did all of the entry planting that you can kind of see in the bottom right hand corner. And um, one of the first phases was um, installing um, uh, meadows, fine fescue meadows, which was a, um, uh, a strategy that golf course architects implemented in the early um, 20th century to allow the superintendents to maintain less um, lawn. And so um, it also <clears throat> helps with erosion issues. Um, but also creates an, an incredible ephemeral experience through summer, like super wispy um, of lawn. Next slide. <clears throat> Sorry, I've lost my voice. Um, so this is fine fescue. Like a lot of people use fine fescue as a, a lawn uh, species. But if you let it go to seed in June, it looks like this. Um, and it will stay like this throughout the summer. And... Um, it really creates this really incredible texture um, juxtaposed against very manicured um, uh, golf course planting. And really reduces a lot of the mowing on steep, steep hills and things like that. So we're actually taking a lot of the golf course back to this. Um, and so it's like a phased approach, easing membership into um, this aesthetic. But we think it's a good one and you don't have to treat this with chemicals so it's good for the environment too next slide um, we're working at arkansas tech with um, a firm called smith group massive architecture firm working with a tiny landscape architecture firm um, but this is reimagining the center of their campus the current campus literally is a parking lot and um, so we're blowing away a building in the parking lot and creating a new student union rec center connects the campus together and at the heart of it is this um, Mullins Plaza and Lawn. Next slide. So transforming what is a parking lot into this and giving um, this campus uh, a new heart we think is a really incredible transformation uh, and one we're really excited about. So this goes into construction in a couple weeks. Should have showed you before. Next slide. I'm almost done here, I promise. Um, we're working with Lake Flato Architects out of um, uh, Austin and San Antonio, Texas, uh, at Penn here in Philadelphia. Um, and this is the new Data Science Center. So we're doing you know, large, um, large scale um, designs, like 120 acre golf courses, but then we're also just doing tiny little streetscapes in Philadelphia um, because we love working with great architects. So this, um, the design for this from the landscape perspective is just a few benches and some tree planters. Next slide. Um, we're working, uh, I love working in historic uh, landscapes. And um, this is Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia, which almost looks like um, uh, some of the hills in Rome, the cemetery hills in, in Rome. You know, all of my time with Terry there kind of remind, it reminds me of that. Um, but again, it's a, a, landscape, a historic landscape um, that has been forgotten and the programming uh, it can't be programmed because there's nowhere for people to congregate. So we're working with Digsaw Architects, phenomenal architects here in Philly, um, to create a new visitor center, which will be a venue for all sorts of different things. Uh, and we, we think people will get married here. Um, the, the view up the hill, which I wish I showed today, um, is incredible. Next slide. Oh, there's the view up the hill. So this is... Um, one of the interior um, uh, views out to that landscape. 
Next slide. Uh, and then this is the last slide. We just kicked off um, design for um, the Philadelphia Cricket Club, which is a historic golf golf club here in Philadelphia. We never ever thought we would be working on golf courses. We are not golf course architects. We are placemakers. And um, so it's kind of fun that these, because of the work we did at White Marsh, Philadelphia Cricket Club gave us a ring and said, hey, we want that too. Um, and so now we're working on <clears throat> a master plan for them too. So anyway, I know that was long-winded, I apologize, but um, that's just a little of what we're up to. Thank you. Thanks, Will. No, that was awesome, and I think students enjoy seeing a lot of visuals, so. Awesome. I think um, as long as you undo your remote and then monitor should be up. All right. Um, do y'all mind clicking? It's just like two or three slides, but um, uh, just to kind of, God, after following Will, I don't have a lot of images about the work, but um, I really want to kind of focus on today, just kind of how I got to where I am in Orlando now. Um, a one or two formative projects and then kind of one or two tips of how to <laughs> manage the world that we're in right now. But um, once again, I'm Carter Gresham. I'm a project landscape architect um, at SNME. We're a multidisciplinary firm in Orlando. Um, but if you do the next slide, um, I think it'll just show yes, yeah, just group photos. So, um, so I actually started out in St. Augustine. Um, how I got there, I actually was absolutely hellbent on Charleston, South Carolina. My thesis, um, my thesis advisor was Terry, and I worked with Brian, Patrick, and Mente just exhaustively um, on this project, and I just fell in love with the city so much. Um, and I started realizing it wasn't just the city, it was kind of the criteria for what I was looking for. I was looking for a city on the water. I was born and raised in the Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads area, so I wanted water. I wanted history, I wanted a little bit of tourism, and I wanted an area that felt like it really had a, a character to it. It wasn't anywhere out in USA. Um, so I was looking at Charleston and I had a couple prospects going through there and interviews and none of them really panned out. And I actually was walking across the stage graduation and got a call from a firm that I had reached out to in March of that year um, that I'll be honest, kind of iced me. And I was like, okay, all right, well, there, I guess you're not on the list anymore. That's okay, that's fine. And they called as I'm walking into Lane Stadium and said, would you like to fly down to St. Augustine? Um, when can you be here? Um, so I moved out of Blacksburg on a Sunday night and was in St. Augustine on Tuesday. Um, and I interviewed and got the job at Marcus Latterman Hallback, which is this very small boutique firm right in the heart of St. Augustine. If you've never been to St. Augustine, think Charleston, New Orleans, and a little bit of Spanish kind of flair from Miami kind of thing. Um, and it's a beautiful city. I loved working there. Um, you, we, the building that you're actually looking at is this old converted historic home um, that became an office with two or three offices, with the attic being an office, our office in the front. And every day I'd sit out and look out on um, the road in front of me and there'd be horse-drawn carriages constantly. And every once in a while, I'd be like, this is a strange, this is not where I thought I was going, but okay, this is, this is interesting. Um, and it was a phenomenal experience kind of learning and growing there. At the smallest, we were about two or three people um, as a whole. And at the largest, um, when I actually left, there were about 10 of us. Um, and it was a great opportunity um, straight out of college to really get thrown into it. Um, I was kind of expecting uh, a little bit of a training, a little bit of a learning curve in the first couple months. And we had someone leave uh, two weeks after I started, not because I started, but two weeks after I started and any training I had got thrown out the window. And they said, we need you now, let's go. And it was this fantastic opportunity to just get fed to the wolves and kind of just thrown into it and kind of learn really on the fly. And it, uh, it helps. I never thought, I actually became senior associate a year and a half out of school. And if I'd never in a million years would have thought that. And it kind of becoming a little pseudo project manager early in at 24, 25, uh, it really kind of was a formative experience to really start to kind of, you going out in the world and going out and kind of figuring out where you're comfortable, you're going to find things that, you know what, I want to learn more about. I want to go outside of my comfort zone. And then there are going to be some things that you're like, you know what? I 
I, I really want to be involved in this, but maybe I don't want to be running the show. And that's those experiences and those lessons are pivotal to, in, especially in your first couple of years. I've been out for f four years this May and really kind of as you build your comfort level on things and you kind of find your niche. Um, one of the fantastic things about what we do as landscape architects is um, the fact that there's no one route. I started at tech as an architecture uh, major and we were in the middle of the recession and I sat in the, sat in all of these, um, uh, the foundation presentations and was getting a little bit nervous about, I'm going to become, there's, there's one path in architecture. I was going to become an architect. And then um, I, I know he's on here and I always give him credit for this, but uh, Mr. Brian Caton came in and gave a presentation uh, for landscape architecture in the first month of foundation year. And I'm just sitting in the back taking copious notes, um, surrounded by uh, people who were already in LA and they could tell that I was like, oh, maybe we should talk to you. And the next day I went into Brian's office and switched because there were so many opportunities to kind of explore where you want to go. Um, you could be in LA, you can go get licensed, you could go a little more urban design, you can go run a planning department and run an urban design department at a city. There's just so many avenues. So down the line, um, after about three years at MLH in St. Augustine, I realized I want to go explore a little bit more. I was working at a solely landscape architectural firm with a little bit of planning on the side. Um, and I really wanted to go work with a firm that was multidisciplinary to learn as much as I could. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to know more about the civil engineering side. I wanted to know environmental survey, um, healthcare, all of these different sides and kind of expand what I knew. So I actually... Uh, just uh, about the same time that Elena switched, uh, or Elena came back from the AT, I started at a firm in Orlando called SME, which is uh, predominantly an engineering firm, but it's a huge 1,200 person firm that has these two core studios in Nashville and in Orlando, um, focusing on landscape architecture and planning. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, so these two, and the bottom right is pixelated for a reason, we'll get to that in a second. Um, in the interview um, for the job in Orlando back in September, um, actually during a hurricane. So I'm going back to Florida tomorrow when there's a hurricane. So great timing. Um, they asked me what was more, what was the one of the more formative moments of your time in your first three years? And I said, um, you may not like this answer, but it's not going to be a specific design project, but it's going to be more a period of time. And um, the period of time is what you're looking at on the screen. So the, on the left was an article um, for one of the projects that we were doing block by block. And it's a funny moment in your life as a young landscape architect laying in bed in the morning, reading the paper on your phone. And your quote is the, uh, the headline of the newspaper for the week. And you start to get a little freaked out about what did I say? Um, and on the right, I'm going to touch on this lightly because we are in a, it's we could talk about the thing on the right for hours and hours and hours and it's pixelated for a reason we're not even going to get into that we were tasked with contextualizing a confederate monument in downtown st augustine and i was 25 and i was the point guy in being essentially a design liaison between the city of st augustine my firm and an appointed board and I told them in my interview, one of the most formative moments was being attached and kind of running a little bit, running a project that wasn't about the beauty of a design. It was about the moment. Um, it was about having a dialogue, having a conversation, and a conversation that is not easy, was never easy, was never clear cut, was never clean, but a conversation that needed to be had um, and needed, um, needed a design background where you were not there to have an opinion, and I, I have Ariel, uh, Elena, a lot of people know that I have a lot of opinions, but essentially you are there to serve the community in the best way you know how. And that's to be a mediator, be someone that could see all, see everybody's kind of opinions and try and say, you know what, we're gonna make something subtle, we're gonna make something fit, and we're gonna make something that can maybe bridge some gaps. So it was a four month period of monthly meetings where this appointed board of these phenomenal, I mean, phenomenal pillars of civil service in our city, um, recreation coaches, directors of departments, um, pastors, um, civil rights activists came together and wanted to come up with 
essentially this text that is contextualizing a war memorial in the middle of the city. And it was a moment that I sat in the back as a new, a new alumni two or three years out and said, well, I was not expecting to have to play a role in this and to kind of sit back and kind of experience that from that huge, I mean, and even now this was in the news two years ago when we did this. Um, and actually as an update, the monument now is boarded up with plywood so no one will vandalize it because it's going to be moved now. Everything's been reversed. In two years, everything was reversed. And the contextualization plaques are still sitting there. And um, I've actually had city officials reach out to me and say, if you want to see these plaques again, you probably need to come soon. Um, but it's, it was a moment that it wasn't about a park. It wasn't anything. And I love, I, I mainly work in recreation and a little bit of um, healthcare and hospitality as well, especially in Florida. But it was a moment where you have to be good at talking to people first and foremost. And that was the thing that I told uh, my bosses when they were interviewing me. The thing that I'm the most proud of is that um, I'm not gonna talk about one project. I'm gonna talk about being able to talk to people, being able to be a mediator, being able to um, walk into a meeting in the city of St. Augustine city council chambers and have the most hated person in the city. And by hated, not because of her views or anything, but the person that you wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole because she hates everything from a design perspective. I was proud to be the person that she would come running up to because she knew I would listen. She knew I would try and explain design to her in a way that was palatable to her. Um, so um, I kind of, I brought that to my now bosses and said, I want to be here to help you bring design to people that maybe design isn't for or design they don't think it's for you. Um, so it kind of, it was one of those more formative moments, um, even three or four years out. And it, it can happen to anybody. You might, every once in a while, you're going to get put on a project that is, a big project that really makes you question a lot of things, make you think about a lot of things. It just, you really have to focus your efforts and be a mediator, be a person that can help translate things for people. And then the next slide, or the final slide, um, was just travel. Um, and then I think the next slide is travel. Yeah. So um, kind of a little bit lighter fare, um, just to wrap up. We are in strange, strange, strange times. Um, I, I will be the first to say I started in October and in March, we work in a 1200 person firm. I, I was hoarding every paycheck I could find, wondering what life was gonna be like, wondering what layoffs were gonna be like. I work, I live in the tourist capital of the world and uh, it's beyond pandemic now. It's more just looking at how it's going to reshape an economy for our city and an entire state. But what we've almost kind of taken solace in the fact that tourism is an escape. And I bring that up and tourism as an escape of, as more of a tip for people in school or fresh out of school is for someone who's lived in a tourist area my entire life, whether St. Augustine, Virginia Beach or Orlando, one of the best tips I can give you um, as a student or as a new alumni is get out there go go see this was all this was ireland and scotland before the pandemic but get out there go do something go be crazy like elena alves and walk hike the entire at like really do it <laughs> because it, it's we're all working from home we're all experiencing this in completely different ways some people are enjoying it some people hate it um it's okay to be confused by this experience. It's okay to be in school and be a little bit nervous, but go out there, go see some stuff, occupy your mind for something on your, occupy your mind with something. And it, it's going to make you a better designer because you're going to get out there. You're not going to just think, Oh, hi, my boss is on this air. Um, <laughs> it's, you're going to kind of, you're going to get that out there and think more. You're going to, when you graduate, for the, for the fifth years on the call, fourth years on the call, I get it that you're nervous. I'm nervous and I'm employed right now. Get out there. We're going to, you're going to move out in the world. There's going to be changes. It's going to look a little different, but it's going to happen. Um, so get out there and travel and um, that will be me. So who's next? <laughs> Thanks, Carter. That was awesome. I always, I've always loved your energy. So that was really nice. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> And I think we just have one more. Hey, Amanda. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Sweet. You can okay. go ahead, Nathan. Okay. Hello. Um, 
My name is Nathan Lay. Uh, I graduated in 2006. Uh, Brian was my thesis advisor, and just to show Will, I found mine too. It's still floating around. Brian's on there. Um, it's it, mine was a yellow. Is it yellowed like mine? Oh, dude, I've got coffee stains and watercolor paint and other stuff all over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my my thesis project was a uh, a zoological exhibit, uh, the Norfolk Zoo. Um, so it was a kind of a different different sort of experience. Um, and so uh, from that, that was just something funny. I did. I just saw the other day upstairs. Um, but. I've had kind of a more sort of uh, different journey to where I am. And so I kind of wanted to go through that in, in a way to say that it's not just the direct path um, to landscape architecture, if you will. Um, so I just have a few slides, but it's going to be more story time. That's what I'm good at. So uh, I went into the program. Um, with the intention of designing golf courses. I realized quickly there was so much more and so many uh, better opportunities to give back to the community uh, through design and things than sort of working in the elitist world of, of golf course architecture. Um, that being said, I've worked on quite a few golf courses, but um, in in that regard, uh, you know, I graduated from the program in 06 uh, due to some circumstances uh, related to alcohol and driving cars. Uh, was I kind of took about a year off. Um, I worked golf course maintenance. I cut a lot of grass, uh, just kind of regrouping. And so I started my career about 2007. I was working for a landscape contractor. Um, I was not doing anything at all design work. Um, they had a handful of landscape architects at the office at the time. Um, as I was there, they kind of piddled away and piddled away. Um, but through that opportunity, I was able to work with a man named Kent Brinkley. Um, Kent's fellow ASLA. He is a historical landscape architect. He was at Colonial Williamsburg for 20 years uh, and just a tremendous wealth of information. So uh, by working with him, even though we were working for landscape contractors, I was drafting designs literally all day, every day of people without degrees at all that looked down on people with college degrees and, and with landscape architects, especially. We over-designed everything. We didn't know anything about plants. That was sort of the what we heard a lot of. Um, However, through that opportunity or through that time there, I was there about four and a half years um, and working with Kent, I was able to work with uh, this Great Bridge Battlefield Park. Um, the idea here was a completely just a field next to the intercoastal waterway uh, along a major roadway where a Revolutionary War battle had taken place, uh, the Battle of Great Bridge. The local history here um, at this site and how we wanted to design or how we were tasked to design it, which was to create this natural landscape that gave the same feeling as they might have felt during the battle. Um, and with, with that in mind, what, what we did, we, we literally did all of the construction documents, uh, all, the, all of the details, all the planting design. And basically, I ended up doing the vast majority of all of this on my own with a little bit of direction from Brinkley who did everything by hand. So we, we created about 18 pages of construction documents in about 30 hours. Um, not long after I was um, laid off, if you will, or I think I was threatened with violence and fired, but it was one way or the other, that's, that's what happened. Um, so I never got to see this through to completion as, as far as the designer goes, but now that it's built, it's been really nice um, to go back occasionally and check it out, as well as um, just see how the evolution of this park has taken place um, with regards to now there's a historical center that's slowly starting to get full of another exhibit. and. Uh, for me, what I learned at this first job was really that I could do this. Um, when I graduated, I didn't know if I wanted to continue to do landscape architecture. 
I was burned out. Um, I, I was really kind of just drifting, if you will. Um, this gave me the confidence that I could do this. So uh, when I left this job, uh, I went to, I ended up going to a, can we do the next slide, please? You should have control now, sorry. Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, when I left this uh, first job, I went uh, to a place called MSA, which is a civil engineering firm um, in Virginia Beach. Uh, the landscape architecture component there was essentially, uh, we do commercial sites, we do subdivisions, we do apartment complexes, we do the bare minimums. Um, hey, we do all the Wawa's in the area. We, that's fun, great. Uh, cookie cutter design work, landscape is the least concern, budgets are cut a lot. Uh, this project here is nothing to it. It's a very, very, very simple project um, that is a, a uh, it's a shopping center. It's a Harris Teeter grocery store. Uh, it's in a farm field or what was once a farm field down Pongo towards Sandbridge Air, Virginia Beach. Uh, this was, I put this in because it was the single most difficult project I've done. Uh, the community was so against the development of this site um, for any number of reasons. It was a big uh, developer coming in and doing this and they just didn't want to see it happen. Um, ultimately, we got approved and here it is. It's nothing special, but if you look at the image on the right, these were the berms that were kind of required through all that community pushback. So it did give us a chance to go in and do some really nice landscape elements as buffering and sort of create these sort of coastal coastal dunes, if you will, and really try to use the idea of designing a shopping center um, to create a sense of place. Um, so in my time with MSA, uh, we begin to try to do more than just the bare minimums. Um, although it, it, it has taken years and years and years to kind of get there. And just this week, I had a contractor ask why we spec like 25 more plants than were the bare minimums on a, on a project site. And, and you know, what's that a couple hundred dollars at most in their massive budgets. This is sort of where we are um, in Hampton Roads. We get a lot of that pushback. So hopefully our intentions are to, to kind of take this landscape architecture and, and make it more prominent and more important um, than it sort of has been. Uh, now, not to say there's not some really good firms in Hampton Roads that are doing really good work. Um, it's just more of a, a sort of a developer driven market here. Uh, right. So, all right, this one's great. Um, so through my time um, at MSA, I, I began to realize that I needed to have design outlets um, and things that I could do to, to keep myself sharp. Um, and also, I was what was really nice at that firm is I was given the opportunity to really start working um, sort of pro bono on community causes that I found important. Um, I had worked on the Plot Park, which was in downtown Norfolk. It was an undeveloped site that was, development was stopped during the recession. Some of the local architects came up with an idea of a temporary park. Um, so I was, I was able to work for a few weeks with, with that on the plantings um, and sort of with the background at, at the contract, landscape contractor sort of coordinating and planting installations. Um, so what I've, what I've sort of shown here is this sort of roundabout way that led me to my next sort of realization, if you will, in this slow pursuit of you can, you can do landscape architecture. Um, so what I have here, uh, the top is kind of funny. Um, picture, the picture on the left there is a third year studio with Ben Johnson. Um, that was my first bow tie. And then the picture on the right is here when we were um, working on some concepts for some un undeveloped land down at the ocean front. Uh, this was prior to the wave pool project coming on board. 
uh, we had discussed, uh, there, there's only a handful of mature trees at the ocean front that are on public land. Uh, we wanted to preserve this site, which had been residential homes going back to the 50s. The city bought it, tore everything down, put up no trespassing signs. They didn't even want you to walk your dog in this grass park area. Um, the city councilman quickly set up a meeting with us after that, told us they had decided that was going to be 256 parking spaces with ditches around the sides. So we needed to stop trying to uh, get the community involved um, for our park idea. So instead of stopping, we decided we wanted to do more parks. Um, we just had to find other sites. So some of these sketches here at the bottom are um, some of those other ideas we had. Um, the coffee shop here, the coffee bar and roastery was sort of one of my first uh, community outreach type projects. Uh, the owners, the owners have a ton of landscape vision. Um, one of the owners is like a software engineer that wanted to be a landscape architect and never did it. Now he roasts coffee and um, plants. He, he loves plants. He loves design. He, we were working on phase or a, a, a second iteration of this coffee shop right now, um, taking into account more, more of a sustainable space um, with rain gardens, permeable paving and other things but uh and then in the top here was a golf course competition golf course design competition that i participated in um years and years or very early in my time with msa is just another thing that we were doing or i was doing to keep myself sharp um the idea was this was a historical society for a particular architect, uh, Alistair McKenzie. He designed Augusta National. Um, actually, he worked uh, with Olmsted. Olmsted actually worked on the grounds at Augusta National as well. And the idea is to design it in his style and present it in sort of an old fashioned way uh, as how he may have drawn. So all of these things sort of have, I ended up placing in this competition, I should say. So, so all these things sort of happened and um, the, the work I was doing in the community down at the ocean front in the arts district had led me further into this world of young business owners and all these guys in their late thirties and, and ladies, I, I should say, their late thirties, early forties, some younger, some older, but seeing that entrepreneurial spirit sort of had been, it, it was invigorating. It was inspiring. Um, worked for civil engineers uh, for the eight, last eight and a half years. So it was very, um, I, I don't know, I've, I felt very restricted. And um, however, our design skills were starting to get recognized. We were slowly starting to get opportunities to work on projects that were more landscape based and less focused on engineering and doing city minimums. Um, this this project's one of the last last real landscape designs that had been working on um, in any in any real uh, fun capacity prior prior to um, us shutting down. This is now some of this has been constructed. Uh, we need to go back and get some photos. Uh, what this is at the ocean front, uh, Virginia Beach ocean front. It's a group of historical cottages. Some of them dating to um, over a hundred years old. And whereas just about every developer down here would buy these, tear them down, build townhouses or condos or something else here, uh, this gentleman wanted to preserve them and turn them all into Airbnb uh, short-term rentals. So that's really what he's done. Um, it, he's, he's done a great work. Unfortunately, instead of the sense of place of Virginia Beach, his focus is Key West, which we get a lot of that here um, with our palm tree lovers and I did a project Key West at Chincoteague that anyone knows that's on the Eastern shore and it's not remotely like Key West. Um, but that, that's sort of what we get. Um, and this one was really unique as they were all single family residential lots. Um, so we created this outdoor space that was kind of a, a vein running through that connected each of the cottages and made it sort of have more of a small little, uh, 
resort type feel, sort of a boutique type resort feel. Um, it's just a block and a half from the ocean front and just a few blocks from the arts district and all the restaurants. So I think he was, I think he was successful with this. As, as far as I know, he was open this last, last season, last summer. I'm not sure what he's doing this season with, with the, um, with us in quarantine. And I know tourism's down at the beach, uh, which is their main driver. Um, however, I think we've seen a lot of positive stuff happening at the oceanfront um, with, with regards to design and placemaking, because what's happened is we've realized how resilient our community is, um, of our locals, of our local artists, and um, everyone's really sort of band together. The restaurants have stayed mostly busy. Uh, with to-go orders or outdoor dining. Um, I think my buddy that owns the coffee shop said they were still having 100 plus customers a day. He has not let anyone in his building since March. He closed one of his garage doors and built a to-go window. That's it. Um, I had another friend who had been two years in the making open a restaurant um, during the shutdown. They've been having a ton of success as well. So I think there is a lot to say for um, people, people taking this as a positive and looking at how we can do things differently and sort of forcing ourselves to slow down and pay attention to the places around us and the importance that they have. Um, I hope to see people begin to recognize that there is a much, much greater need for outdoor public space that these should become key design elements when we're factoring in um, just about anything um, from a retail space to to multifamily residentials to rent short term rentals like this. The idea that that a place to get outside to get away for a few minutes now, I think has become so extremely important. Um, people are shut up. Um, at home all day with their children and with their jobs and with their spouses and for some of us and um, that's all a very new experience. Um, so I think as designers we have a lot of opportunities to to take positives away from this from this whole uh, quarantine situation. And so my last this is uh, my last slide. Um, so this is uh, to speak to that community resiliency and kind of le what led into where I am now uh, with, with my career, my profession. And so this project is one of those <clears throat> parks that we have been conceptualizing for the last three years um, on city properties that are underused leftover spaces. Uh, this project is a butterfly garden. It's in a 20 foot alleyway that the city of Virginia Beach owns. It's been platted since uh, I think that since the original platting was done in the 1880s uh, for the first resort here um, at the beach. Never ever has been constructed. Uh, the apartments here on the, on the right hand side were recently redeveloped. Um, and during that they created a swale through here. So um, to help with drainage, as you know, we have a lot of those issues, uh, Hampton Roads area. So this was about two years in the making, getting, getting this thing built. Um, we've had just about every layer of community involvement with it. Um, so just a brief overview, the owner of the coffee shop and I were literally drawing on a map of the arts district of where all the leftover spaces were. Um, the executive director of the Vibe District, which is our arts district, happened to see what we were doing, ask what we were doing, ask how she could help. We identified a handful of spaces that the city owned. Um, she began having conversations with city landscape and parks folks, which um, they actually jumped on board and supported this idea that we had. Um, so where it started was uh, the first year we thought we were gonna get going. Um, we had a bunch of plants that were left over from something in the water festival that were donated to us. And then the city told us we couldn't plant them. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't do that. So the project kind of went on hold for about a year. Um, and next thing I know, I got a call from the executive director. She said, we have plants coming in, in like two weeks. 
um, based on the design you did. We actually sourced the plant material that was spec. It's only going to be about a third of it. Um, we're going to do a volunteer planting day. Um, but before that, we have to get the site prepped. So here I was thinking that the owner of the co coffee shop and I were going to be prepping this entire site by ourselves, which was the fill site full of busted up concrete and other fun things. Well, the city actually reached out and um, City of Virginia Beach Sheriff's Department brought some of their inmates out. The inmate labor force spent a few days on site doing all of the bed prep for us, um, which tremendously sped up our process. Uh, volunteer day, we had over 50 volunteers come out. Uh, we, planted, we planted everything in about two hours. We were blown away by the support of the community on this. And since then, the city has taken over maintenance. We have some of the residents of this apartment complex, which is uh, a mixed income apartment complex uh, with different voucher programs. We have some adults with um, intellectual disabilities living here that, that support themselves living on their own with, with a small, small little a bit of support from a local nonprofit. Uh, Samaritan House has some apartments here. It's really become a sense of place for these people that don't have any green space um, at their facility, although they have some walkable spaces. Um, I have not been out there and seen a resident that didn't stop us and tell us how much they've enjoyed this space. And from that sort of all of these things leading, leading up over these years, uh, years and years um, in May, um, the engineering company informed me that they were going to lay off uh, my help, uh, if you will, my, my assistant in, in this process and expect me to take on uh, her responsibilities as well as continue my own, uh, yet it was not going to be my own department any longer. I was going to be lumped under engineering. Um, that person is Ariel. If you guys don't know, um, she has a, she's very talented. She brings a lot to the equation um, when it comes to landscape architecture, design, focus, um, just organization skills, things that, that I'm not the best at, and um, just a passion to learn. So that, that sort of uh, inspired me to lead into a conversation of, well, what is the future of landscape architecture with this company? Uh, in about 15 minutes, the COO and I had come to an agreement that I could leave um, and start my own company. They would no longer offer those services. They would, they would be willing to contract everything they had on the books with me and everything going forward with me. And so um, we'll say June 1st, uh, Ariel and I officially started Orbis, uh, Orbis Landscape Architecture. Um, we're on a, essentially on a Portsmouth and Norfolk, uh, serving most of Hampton Roads. And so we've been up and running now for just about two months. Um, it's been a very exciting experience, um, you know, and why would you do this necessarily during, during a quarantine? And I think a lot of that has to do with the unorthodox sort of journey I've been on to, to get here, uh, as well as why not. There, the status quo of what I was doing was not what I wanted to be doing. And sometimes you have to take it upon yourself to make, that, make those changes that you, see, that you need to see. Um, I have a lot of friends in the restaurant industry. I look, at, I look to their models. I look to... to chefs a lot and how they have this idea of creating sense of place with food, native local foraged ingredients. They're very similar to things that we do uh, as designers of spaces. And so I've, I've been inspired by a lot of that and a lot of the success I've seen um, just from young entrepreneurs in general. And, you know, seeing Will, um, the journey Will's been on to get where he is to also start his, his own company I think was inspiring as well. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're so excited for, for where we are now. And it's, it's been a, a journey, but it's been a blast. So thank, thank you guys for having me. 
Awesome. Thank you, Nathan, for that. And um, Amanda, if you want to go to the next slide. Let me I think that up. I gave it up. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. Um, I think we're going to open it up to questions, but just a reminder that the contact information for all of us alum are going to be sent to you guys uh, via email on your like weekly email chain that Sam sends out. Um, but I hope you guys enjoyed everyone talking. I think this really gives you all a perspective of after graduation world. Um, as you can see, there's such a range and variety of uh, things that we have all done and things we're doing and things we're pursuing and we all work really hard, right? You might do things that are difficult and uh, controversial. You might do things you don't want to do, but you also do a lot of good good things, excuse me. Um, but just remember that landscape architecture is so much a part of, you know, world and it impacts our everyday lives, you know. So I uh, hope you all enjoyed. But also, I already got a question. I'm not quite sure how much time we have, Amanda, but I think this is a really good question for those of you who want to chime in. Uh, Sam Worley asks, he says, I really enjoy about all the travel done by panelists post-graduation. Considering travel as a mode of experimentation, how as a practicing landscape architect do you incorporate experimentation and discovery into your professional workflow? So just in general, um, I don't travel as much as everybody else. I, I, I like to sit at home and read books, to be honest, uh, is what it is. I love to travel. I just don't do it um, as much as I might like. However, uh, local history and, and knowing about the, the place where you are and, and the community within your, where you're working, I think is extremely important. And, and finding inspiration in those things. Um, I've recently discovered a, 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 some, some of the inventory stuff from the Roanoke Island expeditions from the 1580s, you know, 20 years before Jamestown, where they have highlighted all the native plants here in Carolina, coastal Virginia area. I mean, it's a tremendous resource to go back that far and say, you know, these yuccas were here and being, being uh, sort of looked at whether or not they could make silk with them. I mean, sassafras was a huge export before tobacco. There, there's just bizarre things that we might not think about. Um, so, that, so seek that out and seek those things, even if you can't travel, even if you're shut down, look for inspiration in those ways. Uh, this is Will. I. I'm with Nate. I mean, I, as much as I travel, I also read a lot. Um, I think that you can learn a lot just sitting at the computer these days. I mean, it's unbelievable what you can find on the internet as far as exploration and discovery of materials and systems and everything else. You can basically just YouTube anything. And uh, we live in an incredible time. Um, I also, but I also think at the same time, nothing beats getting out on the road and seeing the world and other kind of cultures and environments uh, in places that you're not familiar with. It kind of gets you out of your bubble. Um, and I think that everything that you see on those trips shapes the, you know, like I was saying, that digital library of the mainframe of your brain. Um, all of the places, all of the buildings, all of the landscapes, all of those things shape who you are. So I think um, the more you can see, the more um, of a reference you have for design and for life. And just generally makes you a more interesting person if you, you know, are well-traveled, I, th I think. That's my two cents. Any other alum who want to input in that question? Uh, sure. So um, when it comes to kind of exploration and experimentation and what you do, sometimes um, you see it a lot in design firms nowadays where some firms are more far reaching than others. Um, you'll have a headquarters 
somewhere and you have a studio somewhere, but your projects are international, national, beyond your backyard. Some studios want to be a little bit more, um, I won't say local because oftentimes these studios go farther than local, but what we have done in Orlando, actually, we made a concerted effort that for our planning uh, work, I, which I do a lot of, I've actually, over time, I've kind of, I jump between the departments constantly because um, I serve as a landscape architect on those projects, but I have a bit of a planning background. They made a concerted effort in Orlando that uh, any projects that we take that are master plan projects, casting forward 10, 20, 30 years, um, will only be in Central Florida. And it's not so much that it's a detriment that we go outside of that. It's not. Uh, we did that in St. Augustine. We'd go, we had work in Georgia, South Carolina, um, and the Bahamas. But in Orlando, it, uh, we kind of use it as our business model to, if you're going to design a community or design the guidelines for a community or design development and kind of figure out a lot of what I do, a lot of LA's think I'm crazy for enjoying this, but I love writing design code. And I know it's so boring to everybody, but I love it so much. Um, and it's really dry, and so you gotta love it. Um, they really wanted us to be rooted in the communities that we're trying to serve. Um, uh, we're working in Kissimmee, just south of downtown Orlando now, which is a large city just south of um, Disney World, actually. Um, and they really wanted us to go into these meetings and be there as a community member. Um, and be able to talk about that and be able to uh, have a true, a true understanding of where you live. Um, so in that exploration, in a way, I brought up travel, but like I haven't, that, that travel was a couple of years ago. And obviously in the situation we're in, it's about kind of, do you know where you live? Do you, do you understand the sense of place of where you live? Have you truly explored where you live? Do you, do you have an understanding of the world that you're in? And in the situation we're in, it's one of the greatest opportunities for it. Um, I'll be the first one. I'm sending an email out to a dean at UC at University of Central Florida to look at a. Um, do you ever allow planners or designers to sit in on your classes, kind of like a panel like this, just to see what people are talking about? Um, people, Orlandoans, Floridians, um, people from the southeast. Where are the students' minds at? Where kind of? How do you know? how do you know your home better? So exploration can be travel, it can be overseas for whenever, um, but exploration can be in your own backyard, it can, it can be your locality and to focus in your efforts on that um, to kind of make you a better designer and bring, bring additional things to the table. So. I'll add that um, just remaining curious, I think is really important and um, taking advantage of people around you and like Will mentioned there's so much information that's so easily accessible so you know for me it's asking an architect at the firm if I can help out with something that's out of you know my sphere um, and challenging myself in that way so you know reach out to your architecture friends see what they're working on and, and, and just try to learn from those around you it's, it's the easiest way to just keep curious and um, just kind of keep pushing the knowledge, um, learn something new. It's, it always keeps you motivated. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, what would you say is the difference between working at a design-driven firm versus working at an engineering-driven firm? Who wants to start? <laughs> I feel like we all all had that experience. I can rant about this for hours. <laughs> um, yes. With an engineering firm, there is a focus primary, and this is not all engineering firms, but my experience, uh, there is pro the focus is primarily on the bottom line. Um, do a project, it gets approved, you're immediately doing a redesign for budget. You're immediately cutting budget, you're immediately cutting budget. I felt there, in my experience, there was not a focus on pursuing specific clients, good clients you wanted to work with. Occasionally you might get those, but you just did, we did everything. Anyone, everyone, whatever they wanted, that's what we did. 
Um, the engineering firm was set up uh, to focus on exponential growth. You know, every year billable goals went up every year, every year, every year, every year, um, which is great if, that, if that's your model. It's not a model I want to have. Um, sure, you have good years. That's fantastic. But uh, this exponential growth, burn yourself out, burn your staff out, uh, just isn't, it's not my, my style. So I would say the biggest thing I learned at the engineering firm was that landscape wasn't important. We will run our pipes through every single parking lot island that you have to put a tree in by code. We don't care. Um, we will do anything we can to make your landscape not meet code. And you will need to find a way to fix that. Um, and we, we just, we were kind of put on the back burner. Um, now that I'm gone, uh, I'm asked to do research on projects at about a rate of, I don't know, anywhere from three to 15 hours a week for, for them. Um, what do we need to do to do this project? What's the next steps? What, what is this? What is that? Um, so I think we bring a lot to the table at engineer firms. It's just a matter of, can you get them to respect you enough to, to kind of let you do your thing? Sorry. That's a and there's totally a stigma about that too. And I will be the first one to say that at tech, I was like, that is not where I'm going. Fun fact, that's where I'm at now. But so I'm going to say the ex exact same thing just flipped slightly. So I started in a solely landscape architecture firm that, and this is bad. And if you're ever in a firm like this, get a little nervous just because it's a little bit of a red flag. We had an absolute monopoly on the city when it came to development to a point that we wouldn't put our signs up anymore because we were it. If, if something was developed in the city of St. Augustine, it went through Carter Gresham or Jeremy Marquis or the other principals, it went through us. And it was like, we had to start rotating people at city meetings because they're like, God, you're at every meeting. You gotta, you gotta back off. And it was constant. And I found at the end of my time at a landscape firm that we were taking on, we weren't being as selective as I thought we should be. So me having this, knowing kind of that stigma at tech, I looked at a firm that when I looked at the site, if you were to pull up my website, you would be like, what does he do? Do I do like, I do F dot. I work like I just do roadways in Orlando. I don't, I don't do any of that. You're going to run into those firms that are outwardly, they're engineering firms and they are truly about the bottom line. You want to find if, if you go that route, Go sit in an interview, listen to the head of design. So in our office, it's planning and design. So civil's in our department, but technically landscape and planning are our own, we are islands, we are our own thing. And listen to the head of that department. Listen to them talking about it. Listen, because what Nathan is talking about is code minimum. And it's, it, you'll do some of that in your life. No matter where you're gonna go, you're probably gonna do one code minimum design, at least in your life. It's, just, it's kind of, you cut your teeth on it. And yes, you will run a pipe through every island and every Walmart in the greater Delmarva Peninsula. That's just how that works. But what I found in mine was the first, the first kind of, okay, this might work, was in the interview when the head of our department said, we're not an engineering firm, we're cross-disciplinary. And I had never heard cross-disciplinary. I'd heard interdisciplinary. I was like, what the hell is cross-disciplinary? And they say, we serve the other departments, but we run our own show. We're not, we're not, we are not a symptom of another department. A lot of times in engineering firms, that's how it is. Landscape is in a way kind of a residual type thing. You want to find, an engineering firm is not bad, but you want to find a place that the landscape architecture, they're, they're respected. They're, they're the ones being selective. And we're in, incredibly selective to a point that it's kind of we're picking projects for specific people in our office because of we know because we know the expertise of that person like i was at the beginning of the pandemic i was asked hey do you want to jump ship and start working in the planning department solely and i said no i don't want to i just got licensed a year ago why did i just waste three thousand dollars on tests if i'm going to become a planner so you kind of get to jump back and forth but it's it's Nathan's definitely, it's definitely, he's totally correct. It's just finding, there's a couple out there that have that balance. It's just, 
you got to search for them. It's, it's not all of them by all means. So yeah, it's a, now it's a great question. <laughs> Kristen, do you want to add anything on this too? Cause I know you know this world pretty well. I was just about to say, Oh, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's just helpful because I know I was in the same boat. I was like, it was getting around to like late July, August. I'm like, Oh, I still don't have a job. This doesn't look great. Um, and I was really apprehensive about applying to civil firms, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with working at a civil firm. I think it's great to have that kind of experience like Elena was talking about where you really get to see how civil engineers think and work and you're surrounding yourself with people that aren't just kind of like an echo chamber of design. Um, and it's really interesting because in the end, everything's got to work together. So um, I think it's just helpful. Like for me, a typical day, like some of the things that I work on, because I know I wish someone would have told me this when I was applying because I mean, you know, they always try and sugarcoat things and um, sometimes it's just not the case. But I typically work on planting plans for subdivisions. Um, if you're going to work at a civil engineering firm, there's a pretty big chance you're doing roadway designs like streetscapes or subdivisions. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'll do like planting plans, like the tree planting um, for subdivisions. We'll do entry monuments and entry planting, and that you have a lot more liberty. Um, you'll do parking lot islands. Our company has like a big contract with Chick-fil-A, so we've done all kinds of planting designs to get them up to code for them to make double drive through to get some mediocre chicken nuggets. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and just things like that where it's like, it's, it's not design focused. Most of the time you are trying to meet the bare minimum, but you do get opportunities to have some kind of flexibility. And I mean, for me, the most helpful thing I thought was just sitting back and watching my boss, like go through site plans, like just drawing things out and seeing how he thinks of things. And cause I mean, in reality, when you start your sponge, you're just there to soak up all the information you possibly can in the quickest amount of time. Um, and so I think in that regard, a civil engineering firm is not a bad option for like a straight out of college job. And it's, it's not, and we've all kind of hit on it a little bit. And I wish someone had told me this sitting in the pent up space at tech, whatever plan you have in your mind for your first couple of years, it's okay. If that plan doesn't happen, it's completely fine. I, I walked into Lane Stadium without a job feeling I, like I was a failure. It doesn't, it's, it's totally okay. And one day you're going to sit in a pinup and you're like, oh, I would never work for an engineering firm. And then four years into your job, you're like, God, I love it here. Like it's, it's okay. The, the plan, you can have some guidance. You can feel really calculated, but you're going to feel yourself. You're going to feel things out over your first couple of years. You're going to find what you like, what you don't like. And that's okay. You don't have to be, you don't have to be phenomenal. <laughs> and the only way you're gonna do that is if you try new things as well. So, you know, don't be afraid to say it again, you broke up, Elena. Oh, I said the only way you're gonna find that out is if you try new things. Oh yeah. So, you know, don't if you not in love with the firm, you can always give it a chance. Nothing's permanent. So, you know, you have to find the goodness in all of it, I think. And you know, I work with engineers, I I thought, you know, you guys aren't inspired designers, but you know, they also can learn from you. And, you know, I would talk to them and be like, yeah, you can't put this here. Maybe if you talk to me sooner and we would work together and yeah. rearrange the design. And yeah. in the end, it's better for it. You know, that's something that I come across a lot. You end up making that space better, even if it's not, the design of your dreams you still helped make this place look better yeah. and like i said before i learned so much from those those kinds of engineer brains they're they're definitely different in how they think but they know how to get things built and they have know how to get things done um and it's something to take in and then add your design finesse to it in the end i think and that when you move on in your career wherever you go you'll have that with you yeah learn how to talk their language mm -hmm. it's, that helps tremendously 
they, they have their own sort of language that they speak with regard to stormwater and grading and drainage. And if you can speak that language, you're already, you're already a step above most landscape architects that they probably uh, interact with, or at least their sort of stereotype that they're going to put us, put us in. Um, but there, there's a lot, there, there is definitely learning opportunities to learn yeah. from these, from these folks. And I mean, I've, done my fair share of grading and drainage plans as well. Um, just being, being there and just kind of sponging and learning that stuff, you know, from them. You also kind of learn how easy it is to do a lot of their stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. And the cool thing is when you, when you have engineers in the office and you learn how to do that stuff, then it's so much easier to explain how you can work together with them to kind of get where you need to be with plans. Like I do, I know I can draw up sewer and water laterals um, for subdivisions. And that's, it's always so annoying because the engineers will draw in all the water laterals after, and then we'll have to put in the trees. And it's like, there's no space to plant a tree when you put these sewer and water laterals in the most inconvenient space. But it saves time when you can speak their language. You could be like, look, you should try putting them even just moving them like five feet this way, whatever kind of thing. Um, just knowing how to speak their language is super important. And really you don't get that in school, like, and you're gonna have to work with civil engineers for the rest of your life. So, well, at least you do landscape architecture, so. Yeah. Not all, not all, not all stormwater ponds are oval shaped. Teach them that. That's yeah. what? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Y'all got any other questions? So it kind of sounds like, you know, coming out of school, you have to like, you know, eat your vegetables by working for the engineers, you know, for a little while, learn how to speak <laughs> their language before you can actually, you know, move on with your career and do the fun stuff, you know, like, you know, designing projects in China and Desert Storm Memorials and stuff, you know, so how exactly do you bridge that gap, you know, work, you know working, you know, designing planters for Chick-fil-A, you know, to doing, you know, like, you know, I don't want to, this is going to sound judgmental, but you know, like actual landscape architecture. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, I did 35 Wendy's, man. Come on, that was landscape architecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the only way I'd, I'd change what you said a little bit and say you're going to eat your vegetables no matter, no matter the firm that you go to. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Engineers, architects, LAs, you, you, you got you to gotta put in the time and, and do that. You've got to be the bottom. You've got to be the bottom rung on the ladder. Yeah. You got to get beat up, and I mean, it's how we grow. There's yeah. no one here who's saying the first thing you need to do is jump into an engineering firm. You can jump into some kind of community design group. We had someone do that in our studio. She worked for a nonprofit doing community design. You can jump straight into landscape architecture strictly firm. You can. This is, this is where it's up to you. You have to reach out and figure out what you want. And don't, don't again, don't think there's a prescription to this. That's not what we're trying to tell you. Yeah. Um, it's like the opposite of that. Um, we had people go in a lot of different directions. One went to grad school to really hone in on her historical preservation. Um, you just have to test things out and find what's right for you. You don't have to say, I'm going to, suffer through this and then I'm gonna eventually get where I want. That's that's absolutely not something you wanna go into because you're gonna go into it being really unmotivated. I believe if you go into your career thinking, well, I have to get through some shit years first, that's not gonna inspire you at all. Um, so don't, don't think like that. And don't think you need to also settle for a firm that you don't believe in what they're doing. I think that's kind of backwards as well, so. <clears throat> this is Rolf. I, um, I've only met three, maybe four, civil engineers that I ever liked as, as people, human <laughs> beings, <laughs> engineers. Um, my suggestion to you is to work for a landscape architecture firm that's, um, that hire, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, that hires civil engineers as consultants because then you can tell them what to do. Uh, the other way around um, 
we have civil engineering consultants all the time and symmetry and tree placement in our designs is incredibly important and um, they're going to be moving utilities to make way for those because they're our consultants and not the other way around. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just one approach. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it's a lot um, more fun to tell people what to do than be told what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, w I would agree with Will. We do, we, we, we've been talking about working for civil engineers, but we do have a landscape architecture firm here at the beach, um, WPL, the Billy Almonds group. Um, they have civil, but they are predominantly landscape. Uh, they have two, maybe three civil guys. Um, I want to say they have at least six landscape. That That's their focus. Um, and it's exactly what Will said. They just bring, bring them in as part of the team versus where I was, I was brought in as part of the team uh, by the civil. Um, but that's, that's exactly right. If you're in charge, man, it's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll yeah. ask. Car Carter, are you from Virginia Beach? Did I hear that right? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Virginia Beach and Chesapeake, and then I'm actually here now. I came up for the fourth, and then my boss was like, just stay for a little while. So, yeah, I've been here for about five weeks, and I'm actually driving back to Orlando in the morning. Oh, wow. Are you with, are you one of the Greshams, if you will? Um, oh, like E.T.? Yeah. No, so distant, okay. distant family, but I wish I had his money. Um, for those of you who don't know, from Hampton Roads, it's a huge construction firm, like really huge construction firm. And there's a design firm in Florida that's called Gresham Partners that I interviewed with. And I was like, if you don't give me the job, like, <laughs> and then I turned them down. Um, but uh, no, uh, no, 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 distant, distant family. But um, yeah, I grew up here, worked here, worked here for a long time. And then the second I graduated from tech, went to the global epicenter of COVID-19. So Whoa. excited to get back to it in 12 hours. <laughs> hey, with Disney's open, right? Hey, don't joke. I have a reservation at Epcot in a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for uh, real. <laughs> real quick, I, I did have a question. We talked just a little bit about um, about reading since we, we can't travel at present, but um, has anyone read any books that uh, have been interesting? Um, always uh, nice to hear recommendations. Just, uh, just a quick little uh, question. Um, I read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance every two to three years. I would say that's required reading for me. Um, gosh. Lately, I have been on, pr prior to the social unrest, I was already on a tear of um, black author, contemporary black authors writing about, um, you know, sort of their experiences. In, any, anything uh, stamped from the beginning is about 600 pages on the history of racism in America. It goes back 400 plus years. It's a, quite incredible. Um, how it relates to sort of everything that I think is happening in our public spaces um, with regards to these monuments. Uh, here in Virginia, we have an in incredible amount of, of those monuments that are now these really engaged community spaces. Um, so I think I kind of lucked out and I just started reading that stuff on my own back in like February and I uh, kind of had a head head start on it um uh, and if if we're talking about just reading for fun and while we have downtime my struggle carlo knosgaard he's a norwegian writer it's a six book book it's 3600 pages about a norwegian man writing a 3600 page novel and it's beautiful um so those are kind of my uh top three if you will um, the Cooking Gene by Michael Twitty is also another incredible one. That's what I've been into lately. I read about 30 books a year, or I try to, since college. <laughs> I, I read about two, so. <laughs> I read you know, at least that many at once. <laughs> I was like, uh, maybe two. Uh, I haven't started it yet, but Olmstead, like, just read Olmstead. Just, I'm about to start um, 
his journey his journey through texas which is just literally his just diary writings while he was traveling through texas but um i gotta finish the book that i'm reading right now which is not about landscape at all at all but i actually would say every once in a while when you read a book about the subject matter that you're obviously interested throw in something short as like a palate cleanser just every once in a while just to keep especially in the world we're in right now where a walk or a run through your city is not enough to get out of your head. Throw in something just, I'm not saying crappy, but just throw in something that is a little different that's totally left field. Like I'm gonna start Olmstead, but I'm finishing a book right now on the, the French Revolution. Like just throw in some stuff occasionally as a palate cleanser. It'll keep you involved. You need a laugh, listen to Amy Poehler read her, uh, oh, yes, <laughs> autobiography, so funny. She's or read Elena's posts about doing the AT. And I'm, that's not even a joke. Read her posts about doing the AT. That was, in, that was entertaining. People loved that. They were like living for me. She, when I say she got famous, y'all, she got famous off, off of those posts. Yeah. Read an incredible amount of cookbooks. I don't cook. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. These guys, there's so much what they're writing about is I, I find so relational to what we do, which is we create designs based on experiences and using um, local ingredients, if you will. Uh, so I've, I've found a lot of inspiration in cookbooks, um, more so than maybe highbrow design philosophy or, or something like that. I'm a huge Eric Larson fan. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. He's probably like turning his nose up to me, but um, <laughs> man, I, every time I pick up one of his books, I cannot put it down. It's like such a good um, storyteller. And the latest one on Churchill um, is phenomenal. Um, but like landscape focused books, um, two that I've read that are relatively new in the last 12 months, um, Michael Van Valkenburg's Making a Garden. Uh, it's the story of the Isabella Stewart um, Monk's Garden and how they went through that design process from concept sketch like on a manila envelope to st uh, stone sourcing and mock-ups and planting plans and all that stuff. It just it's, um, shows you inside the mind of a genius. Um, and then another one um, that I really enjoyed reading is Lori's um, be seated. Um, and it shows all of his sketches from Europe and everywhere else of him studying benches and seats and all that stuff. And again, it's another glimpse inside the mind of a pretty talented landscape architect. Read Moby Dick at least once in your life. I've read Eric Larson, Will, a couple times. Yeah. I've read the, the U-Boat book, and I've read Devil in the White yeah. City. Yeah, the U-Boat one was, like, incredible. Yeah, he just had a book come out. Um, John Krakauer is amazing, too. Into the Wild is kind of cliche now, but uh, some of his other stuff, the writing about the history of Mormon religion is pretty fascinating, and um, Into Thin Air is just bizarre i don't know how you continue to do anything after that experience yeah sure. also, ask that question when you're back uh, i don't know how tech's going to be in a couple of weeks but ask the professors they always have good good recommendations especially yeah. kate especially kate he's going to give you some interesting stuff <laughs> thank you guys that should should keep me busy for a while. <laughs> yeah. Always, always nice to to hear everybody's tastes and uh, little kind of supplement each each sec and uh, get get a uh, a little smarter on different things. So thank you. That was a great question. I think that's one of the things I miss the most about like being in a studio environment was constantly passing books around and share and sharing that stuff. I have so many books on my bookshelves when I open them up to someone else's name inside them. From oh, yeah. Like, I'm sorry, I stole this from you. I, I feel like every textbook from tech is <laughs> mine that you have. I think I have all your books. All of them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure.
I've, I have two copies of Delirious New York by Rim Kuas I've never purchased. <laughs> One of them is from is Brandon Capillaries. So, gotcha. <laughs> Okay, do we have any other last minute questions from the students? Or any extra fun um, commentary? Sorry, yeah, I've got one. Um, would you say that you're satisfied with where you are in your career and do you have any future career aspirations? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it's a good question. I, can, I mean, I'm never satisfied. I'm always pissed off at myself for not, you know, taking it to the next level or drawing the right thing and getting something, getting something built. And I was like, ah, oh, I wish I would have done it this way. But I think what that does is it builds your character. And um, again, that reference library of, you know, there's nothing more rewarding than getting stuff built. And even if it gets built wrong or not the way you imagined, it'll allow you to it instills in you um, a memory. And when it comes around to the next time, you'll do it better. So I think that's super important um, as you go through your career. And it, if you look at like landscape architects work, you know, like Michael Van Balkenberg, you, you can see an evolution in his work and he's like slowly picking up and fine tuning his um, design aesthetic, his construction practices, all those things through his career and it just gets better and better and better. It's just like writing or anything else. So I remember what the question was, but. Um, are, are you satisfied and what, what might you yeah. want to do? Um, yeah. Never be satisfied, stay hungry. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of with Will there. I. I, in, in the grand scheme, yes, I'm very satisfied in the sense that I'm doing something I'm very passionate about, even though it's taken me a while to get to that point. But I also, and I don't know if it's the nature of what, what we do. I don't know if it's the nature of the education that we went through, but there's this sort of looming sensation that nothing's ever good enough. Um, and you know, sometimes it can bog you down, but I think it, it can keep you hungry as well. Um, for me, as far as what is still to do, uh, besides from growing um, Orbis in, into a known design firm, I, I have a lot of inclinations to write, uh, to write about landscape architecture and about historical um, sort of placemaking I've been researching uh, the history of Virginia Beach as a town. Um, and what, what you don't or may not realize is uh, in the 1860s, we had a couple hundred free African-Americans living pre-Civil War in the area that ultimately became the resort district of Virginia Beach. Uh, that history has kind of been eroded. Um, so there, there's so much still to do and so many stories still to tell through, through design and design-based research. And Nathan and Will brought up great points. I think I'd answer it, I'm happy. I don't know if satisfied would be the word because the best advice I've ever been given by a professor at TEP was, I can't remember who it was, it was either Terry or Brian, but they said the day that you know everything in the job, walk. Because it's not, you're not, you, you're gonna stall. The day that you don't have any of the questions, the day that you're not stressing over something, walk. Because it's it's not a job, that's a that's a thing that you're just put you're punching in and you're punching out. Um stay, I mean, ask as many questions as you can. I mean, really you want to kind of focus in your efforts on where you're at. Um for me, I kind of whenever I get a little bit not stuck or anything, but if I'm like, you know what, I want to kind of entertain myself at night but still let stay in kind of that mindset no one was pressuring me to get licensed but in my head it was going back to school kind of thing because i took i mean i i remember uh oh my god i'm forgetting his name who runs the firm in roanoke who does pro practice oh my god what's his name you guys dave. talking about dave don't talk about dave it's dave <laughs> don't talk about that guy He's okay not. agreed but 
I don't remember anything from that. I had to like reteach myself everything from that class before taking the, t the national exam. And it was like, oh, wow, I'm taking myself back to school. So I literally took, it was like going kind of it, licensure for me was kind of fun because it felt like you were, you were learning plenty of things in your job and in your office, but you were kind of hitting the books again and kind of using that to further where you're at and kind of made you take stock of where you are. So um, you keep, I mean, keep yourself moving forward, keep yourself learning new things constantly and kind of set some milestones as you move forward. I'm going to counter and say, Oh God. And be satisfied, but don't be complacent. Um, yeah. I think if you're constantly not satisfied, you might not, ever be like truly happy and I guess that's when you know I finished hiking and did this insane thing and I went to a wedding right away and everyone's like well what's next and I'm like can I just like enjoy this thing that just happened to me do I have to be planning for that next moment um and I think those kind of questions made me like like all right well, what is next and I'm like let's enjoy that for a sec that was awesome um, and I'm going to dwell on that well, cause it happened and then, yeah, when I'm ready, like, let's, what's, what's that next challenge? And I think the same in your career, I think you can be like, I'm very happy and I'm pretty satisfied with where I am right now. That doesn't mean this is it. <laughs> That's, um, I, I want to obviously still grow and uh, become a better designer, but I'm definitely like really into what's happening right now in terms of my career. So Definitely stay hungry though. Enjoy it a little. Just a side note, um, Carter, that was definitely Terry because the amount of times that I quote her on exactly like what you said is a oh. bunch. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. They they actually I, I went out for drinks right after I graduated with them and they grilled me on like what what we should have been taught. I'm like, no, y'all. The stuff that I wish y'all had taught me, it's hard to teach, so we're good. <laughs> okay, I think we're, we're, I mean, we're getting close to eight, um, so I'm not quite sure, Amanda, what your thoughts are. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for staying on this long. This isn't the first time we've gone over time, but um, this has been the longest one we've had, so this has, like, been a great discussion. I was going to recommend, if it's all right with you all, um, when the contact info gets shared, that, of course, students reach out with questions and anything like that, because, um, yeah, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, um, so thanks for joining, and it was really great to hear so many different perspectives. Um, yeah, this is, like, a nice talk, a nice boost, I think into the new year too. So, um, and thank you, Ariel, for leading this and setting it up because I did nothing. So that was kind of nice this week to have a break or Sam and I to have a break. Um, so really appreciate that and looking forward to hearing more about Orbis. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for sending photos to people, by the way. <laughs> yeah, and those will be, like we always share the presentations um, in a drive and we're gonna post this to the YouTube channel and uh, try to get that going and continuing so if you all want to stay updated on that it'll be posted and we'll keep posting these so, thank you for participating and being here and spending time with us good luck everyone thank y'all yeah um, good luck to you too <laughs> yeah, thanks. thank you guys for having us and students please feel free um to reach out to me with any questions or anything, I, I will always offer my very unhumble opinion. <laughs> Great, we need that. Nice. Also, never forget that people like me and Ariel are literally just two years older than you. We're not unapproachable because we graduated. Like, feel free to reach out at any time. It really is not that serious. <laughs> I'm four years older, what are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking I'm me and Ariel. I know, I'm kidding. I know. <laughs> I tend we're to not act like, we're not old people. <laughs> I, I tend to act like an eighteen year old, so yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Same. It was great. It'd be great to get updates from y'all too. So I mean all the way around too. Feel free to reach out with anything that happens, anything exciting and new. Yeah, come to but. Florida if you dare. <laughs>
Get, um, have safe travels back. <laughs> yeah, hurricane season. Ooh. I'll live tweet it. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget your mask. Eight hours. 5 a.m. Let's go. All right. Good. All right. Yeah. Yep. We'll say bye now. <laughs> yeah. Thank Thanks. Thank stay safe. Yep. Stay safe, everybody. Bye. 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 bye.